Okay, so welcome. Uh, and especially let me know if I speak too quickly. <laughs> um, so I've been uh, who I am. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I will talk about uh, uh, opcodes and uh, a bit, a little bit about the PE file formats and their oddities. So I've been a reverse engineer for uh, some years, for some time. Uh, so I'm cre I created a project called Corkami. And uh, um, I also, in the past, I worked on the MAME, the arcade emulator. And uh, professionally, I'm a malware analyst, but this is only on my uh, be the behalf of my hobbies. This is just my own experiments and research at home. So I'll introduce uh, Corkami. Corkami is just the project, the name of the project that I created for its RC or oriented uh, project. Uh, I try to keep it directly to, c to the technical stuff, uh, no ads, no download, no login required, and really direct the, the good stuff. And I try to update and make it useful. So I also created the cheat sheets and the kind of easy document that I would use myself for the work on a daily basis. But it's only hobby. I do that once the kids are asleep and uh, <laughs> until late, uh, late at night. So it probably doesn't look professional and as good as it would like to be. So right, so right now, the, Korkami, the form of Korkami is uh, wiki pages and cheat sheets. And uh, I focus on the creating as many as possible re relevant proof of concepts. So the binaries are handwritten. Usually, I don't use a compiler. I created the P myself so that it's only focusing on the exact interesting points. And you don't have a lot of noise. Even you don't probably need to either to actually understand what's going on because I, I try to focus only what's important. The binaries are all directly available with to download, so you can really test your debugger, your tool, your knowledge, or just get them directly from that. Uh, so far, I focused uh, on the PDF uh, assembly and the PE file format, a few other stuff, but that's mainly the most uh, covered subject of my uh, website. And I also share that with the uh, very permissive license. So BSD, you can reuse them commercially, whatever. Even the images are done in an in a open source format. So uh, the story behind this presentation is that uh, some time ago, I was young and innocent. And I thought that CPU being electronics and whatever, it had to be perfectly logic and uh, no problem. Then I was tricked by uh, malware and uh, the Basically, uh, Ida wasn't able to do to work on it, so I decided to go back to the basics and study assembly and PE files uh, from scratch. I created in the meantime uh, documents on Korkami, as I said, and now I'm presenting you more or less the final result or the, the good programs result. Uh, if I wasn't, uh, if I was just a guy who learned assembly, and uh, I would probably wouldn't uh, uh, be in hash days to talk about it. If I didn't get a few. Uh, achievements uh, from various tools. So basically, I failed all the disassemblers that I tried. And I uh, also c created a few crashes in IDA. So not rain. I insist that the, all the authors are n uh, were notified. And most of the bugs are already fixed. But uh, six. Uh, so basically, it was like this in 6.1. You get a direct crash. But now it's fixed in 6.2 and everything. And Hue, that's the latest version. But uh, the newest unreleased, well, the newest beta has fixed that and so on. So um, the agenda for the presentation is that I first try with an uh, easy introduction. But I assume that most of you already know are familiar with this assembly, right? Or yes. And uh, another question, are you all? Um, familiar with, the, or you already had an event of undocumented disassembly in your, or never? Like you trust IDA and that's all. For you, are you common? Is it a common thing who to have an undocumented disassembly in IDA? Raise your arm. Who? No. Okay, not so much. So. Okay, and then so then I, I uh, after the introduction that will go on quickly. I will uh, m mention a few tricks, then introduce the cost that I, the program that I created, and I will m also talk a bit, a little bit more about the PE file format. So, as you all have assembly knowledge, I will go fa quickly on that. So, basically, you compile a binary. There is assembly. There is some uh, relevant. Uh, there is some common points between the code and the uh, assembler, assemble code. Then, of course, there is a relation between the opcode and the code. So, by now, you all know that. So what's important is that the assembly is generated by the compiler. It's, but actually, what is then from the assembly, what is uh, state, the, the only kept in the binary are the opcodes itself, which are understood directly by the CPU, 
which means the CPU just knows what to do with the bytes. It doesn't care if you or you don't or, or the tool you're using knows what it will do because it just does it. And the problem is that what we read is not usually the opcodes for most people, but actually the disassembly. And if the disassembly doesn't give you the, the disassembler doesn't give you any result, well, we're stuck. We are blind. We don't know what execution with the execution will do. And the other problem is that because of opcode length, you don't even know what the next instruction will be because you don't know how to disassemble it. So uh, here, so uh, here I'll just create a few uh, one undocumented opcode in the in the in a simple program. So basically, we just uh, emit uh, um, I say keyword in a, that's a Visual Studio 2010 Ultimate. You will get a byte that is un unidentified at disassembly. So you get the first uh, well, you get uh, question marks. So basically, uh, that's sev this program, even though it costs several thousand of dollars, is not able to well, is doesn't know what to happen. So usually, if you do that, oh yeah, if you if you check the Intel documentation, there is nothing to see at the D6 D6 uh, opcode. So there is nothing to see there. Microsoft doesn't say anything. Intel doesn't say anything. So usually, if you try that, you could expect bad results. So not documented directly. Usually, it's a crash or not the expected result. But here, in this case, the specific case, no problem. We don't know what it was. If we follow Intel or Microsoft documentation, we don't know what happened. But if we, the CPU just uh, does its stuff. So what happened is that actually uh, D6 is a very simple uh, opcode that doesn't do much. But somehow, it's not documented by Intel because it's documented by AMD. And most of the opcodes are actually documented by AMD, but not Intel. I don't know why uh, anyone has an idea why. It's quite a trivial opcode, but it's not. Uh, Intel still says there's nothing there. OK, so it's commonly used. The common use for those undocumented opcodes are malware and packers just to prevent automati automated analysis or easy reverse engineering. What's funny is that. Uh, Intel, um, if you follow the documentation, you will have many holes, but uh, Intel's own disassembler, Z, which is uh, free of use, it's not open source, but just handle all these um, opcodes correctly, while Microsoft and uh, Visual Studio and WinDBG, they follow blindly the documentation, and so they will you, you will get um, question marks, uh, even though Intel perfectly knows what it does. <laughs> so it's like... Uh, Read my, uh, Intel, it's more like do what I disassemble and not uh, do as I disassemble and don't read my documentation. So, uh, of course, you could argue that my, uh, WinDBG is only made to, um, to debug what uh, the compiler, Microsoft compiler created. But then it kind of rules out uh, WinDBG as a malware uh, debugging tool because uh, you, you just insert a D6. I mean, it's trivial and you will the WinDBG is just uh, not able to, to tell you what the instructions are so it's not very useful for a, for a malware analysis tool for a malware analysis debugger so uh, another problem that um, uh, happens is that of course uh, each of the undocumented the things uh, facts are available maybe one you will have in a, in a Trojan one in a packer and everything but it's not so easy to find a good uh, and exhaustive clean uh, test set to actually gather all these undocumented facts. So for example, if you someone say, well, a colleague mentions uh, undocumented uh, opcode or behavior, and then you say, oh yeah, it's in Mebroot, so you skip this uh, part of the file or whatever, and then you are actually, uh, it's, you know, first it's a malware, so you, have, you cannot really spread that, and then it's, there is a lot of noise, the malware payload or something before and after. So it's not so easy to analyze, so that's why I focused on creating a, sm a small and clean uh, test set that would actually provide, uh, insist just on one particular inf uh, instruction or fact. So now let's start at last the real, uh, the real stuff and a few of the undocumented opcodes. But before I actually started um, uh, w wondering what uh, the actual possibilities of the CPUs, I didn't even know what are the possibilities, w what are the opcodes that are still supported or not by the, um, by the CPU. And uh, uh, I think it's a bit like English. Everybody or most people in the world would be able to l read and understand these words. And if you see some disassembly, well, you are used to see all these opcodes. They are made by all the compilers, and they are so common that 
if they are not here, we are a bit ill at ease. And if uh, if it's something different, then we probably be surprised. So this is a standard English, but the Intel CPUs being uh, s uh, were made in the 70s. Uh, yeah, in the 70s. Sorry, uh, it's a bit the same as if you take that's uh, Shakespeare English. So you could say it's still English, but mm, you know it. I don't know. I don't know what that means actually, or maybe I forgot. I quickly forgot at least. And it's a bit the same for those opcodes, which are still supported by all the CPUs that we have, all the Intel CPUs. But uh, we are probably don't know what they actually do, and that's a problem. I actually made a one of one of the proof of concept I made is only using these old opcodes, and these opcodes are actually doing something. So if someone is familiar with uh, reading that, maybe I should ask, how old are you? Because myself, I'm, I'm used to the push uh, jump calls. But when it's about this, mm, what is exactly being done? And it's still working on i i7. And it's still usable by malware, packers, or anything. And yet, some of them are used, uh, unused, totally unused now. And they are still uh, fully working on modern CPUs. And of course, it's a bit like English. It's an evolving language. And a bit like mm, maybe the oldest generation of uh, uh, of people, of human, wouldn't be used to the m buzzwords, the latest buzzwords. These opcodes are uh, sometimes uh, present in the most recent CPUs. So, and you have direct opcodes for CRC32 or AES decryption, string matching, and then some complex operation in just one opcode. Um, so, this uh, is possible. This exists in modern CPUs. Not all of them, of course. Uh, one thing that I like is the move B, move big and the opcode because move big and yen is the rejected of spring. It's only uh, implemented in Atom CPU, which means this uh, netbook uh, supports this opcode. And the i7 64-bit doesn't have this opcode, even though it will have CRC32 or maybe AES code. So, so much for complete backward compatibility. There is no physical CPU, as far as I know, that can uh, uh, emulate, can, that can execute CRC32 and move big and yen. And of course, move big and yen is quite meaningless itself because you already have an opcode for the big, uh, for the NDNS swapping. So I don't know. This uh, small computer has an opcode that most PC don't. OK, why? I don't know. If you know. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. It's uh, totally uh, this uh, move B is uh, totally documented. It's official. Well, no, is it like a CPU flag just for this instruction, or is it implicit by this is a heavy CPU? Uh, it's implicit. Yeah, it's implicit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
basically, um, uh, SM store machine status word is the null 286 CP uh, opcode uh, mnemonic that was created at the 286 era, so before the protected mode was uh, fully created. And it, so it allows you uh, CR, uh, to access, to read the value of CR0s, uh, even from user mode, while uh, uh, the move uh, CR0 is actually a privileged opcode. For some reason, uh, the higher word of the register is undefined officially by the documentation. So Intel just says, this is the value, uh, this, the lowest value is correct, but you cannot expect the real value. So for some reason, I don't know why they say that, because it's actually the value, the higher bits of CR zeros. And in under XP, uh, when you do FPU operation, the value of CR zeros will be modified and eventually reverts by itself. So you can have, just by, ch uh, you do a uh, store machine status word, and then the you expect the result, then you do a FPU operation, then the result should be different, and then eventually the result will revert to the original value. So it's quite a tricky and unexpected anti-emulator. You have a similar trick on 32-bit windows, where JS is not, uh, GS is not stored in the context, so it means that on thread switch, the value of GS is lost, which means if you just wait for something, GS will eventually reset to zero. So if you set GS and you're just stepping manually, this is slow and this creates a thread switch, so instantly GS is lost. And also, like the previous trick, if you just wait for GS not to be, if, if you just loop until GS is not zero, this on a real system will eventually exit of the loop. But the first time uh, it blew me, I was really, I was wondering what, what can happen there. There's no, there's no other threat. And of course, in my proof of concept, it directly starts like this. What happens? GS. So what should happen now? But on a real system, eventually it's uh, made for, it's reset to zero. And another thing is that, of course, it's reset to zero, but not in a zero time. So if you do uh, wait for GS is reset and then another loop, this can only happen between two uh, reset uh, th uh, switch, uh, thread switch, which means it should take a minimum of time, you know, so you, you can use that for timing, uh, uh, anti-emulation timing tricks. Um, of course, uh, I was also thinking that NOP is perfect because NOP is just NOP and does nothing. But originally, NOP is exchange AX with AX or EAX with AX. But the problem is that, so NOP 80, uh, 90 is ne always doing nothing. But on 64 bit, you always ha you have another encoding to actually do exchange EAX, EAX, which this time again doesn't do anything in 32 bit. But like all the other opcodes of uh, 60 in 64 bit mode, it actually resets the higher D word. So you have an exchange EAX that does something, even though at first it looks like it would do nothing, but hopefully NOP, in this case the 90 NOP, is still doing nothing. And this is probably now common in malwares and stuff. Uh, hint NOP was the multibyte word, uh, multibyte NOP that actually gives a hint about what would be executed next by the CPU. Uh, whatever the address here, it wouldn't trigger an exception, but as you can see, it's really a multibyte, uh, it's a, it can be a very long NOP. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird to say. Another thing is, once again, it's partially undocumented by Intel. So actually, uh, the full range of um, um, hint knob encoding are bigger on IMD documentation. And another thing is that because it's multi-byte uh, opcode, if you, at the end of a page, if you insert those bytes, and then it will uh, look for the operands, then it could trigger an exception. So it's a knob that could trigger an exception if at the end of the page. So yeah, thank, thank you, Intel or whatever, I don't know, not sure. Move, once again, I thought move, being move, should be perfectly logic. Sadly not. So first, uh, so it's all this is documented, but it's tricky, because uh, there were even bugs for that in all the disassemblers, I think. Well, except Z, maybe. Um, so uh, when you, you cannot do a CR0 uh, move, a move on CR0 or from CR0 on memory. So the documentation says that the mod RM is ignored. It doesn't mean it's illegal, it's just ignored. So if you do this, which could lead to a crash, it's actually interpreted by that. And you, as far as I can remember, you would fail all these assemblers with that until, until recently. Uh, move a 6D, a 64-bit opcode, uh, is um, sign extending. So theoretically, theoretically, it should work on a, from a smaller register to a bigger register. But if you use no rex prefix, which is discourage, you can actually make it work like a standard move. 
and uh, it, the other way around, move from a selector to uh, 32 bit registers actually works. So many disassemblers were wor uh, disassembling that at move AX CS because that would make the both operand the same size. But actually, the uh, upper word of the target register is undefined, but actually there's no funny thing here. There's no random value. It's zero. So basically it makes it equivalent to move ZX, uh, EAXCS. VSwap is one of my favorites because I think it's like an administration. It's supposed just to swap the indianness of the registers, but because of various uh, reasons, uh, because of yeah, other reasons, external reasons, it's never really doing the work you expect. So only in 64-bit, it's actually s correctly s s swapping the NDNS as you would expect. On EAX, on 64-bits, like all the other 32-bit opcodes, it will actually register the higher the word. Okay. And on Word, uh, it's actually undefined again, but it's commonly used in malwares and packers because it just resets the... So it's like XOR AX AX. Uh, so, uh, with this result, unexplicable, unexplainable result, I uh, understand that Intel probably doesn't want to exp explain or just say it's undefined because we would be too ashamed to actually explain why we get this funny result. So, uh, BSW and BSWAP is, uh, yeah, BSWAP AX is also wrongly disassembled as uh, by WinDBG and so on. So, you think it would just, it, it will be disassembled as BSWAP AX and actually you clear the register. Um, uh, can uh, everybody understand this code? Anybody see the potential trap? So you, it, it pushes the address of next on the stack, then return takes the stack, the address from the stack, and so basically you just jump to an immediate value, and here, no, no, no. Sorry? Uh, execution ordering? Yeah, it starts here. The execution starts here. Well, on the CPU, I think the input instruction is executed. Oh, no, okay. It's not, the, it's not the point here. So, and of course, if you, uh, this is only debug one. So it's been fixed in only debug two. But only debug one is even trying to be nice, telling you this is an automatic command that red is used as a jump to next. Okay, so. And as you can see, not exactly the same text. So what happened? Still no one sees? No? So basically, here you have a 66 prefix on return, which actually makes return re uh, return to IP and not EIP. So actually, you don't jump to 401008, uh, but to 1008. And in this proof of concept, I mapped the null page, and I, and I did some code at this address. So this is actually not a return to this. And uh, the problem, another problem is that uh, the Officially, this is also called a return. It's not, so all the disassemblers added their own, now their own way of disassembling it, like small return or return uh, 16 or something like this. But actually, officially, it's the same mnemonic. So that's the latest hue, I think, and that's only debug one. Now I think maybe the only debug, the latest only debug to fix that, but you can still be tricked just by that. And uh, uh, this 66, uh, so the jump to EIP also works on calls, returns, uh, uh, loops, um, so all the flowing, uh, the flow uh, control opcodes. So I won't enumerate all the tricks because otherwise you'll die of boredom probably. And if you want more, then I created a page on the Corkami and I already made some gr graphs and cheat sheets to, to, to have an easy uh, how do you say, list of opcodes. Uh, and it's quite too much theory for now, so uh, I don't like just uh, reading stuff and not having something to fit my debugger. So I created COST, which stands for Corcomy Standard Test. COST is a single binary. Uh, it's uh, just running, you just, there's no option, you just run it and it will just look, uh, execute a lot of different tests. And then I, I also made it uh, hardened PE, so it's, it may be, uh, um, how do you say, it may help also help you to test the PE sides of your tools or your knowledge. But because in hardened PE, it's okay, actually quite difficult to debug, I also made an easy PE mode so that it's, uh, <laughs> you can study only the assembly and don't not have too much trouble uh, debugging it. So cost contains a lot of tests. Is, I still have some time. Yeah. Uh, 
Cost contains a lot of tests, classic stuff, so very trivial stuff, then a few more complex stuff like uh, jump to IP, IRET, undocumented opcodes, CPU specific like uh, MoveB, PopCount, CRC32, uh, also some uh, detection of OS and uh, VM by using uh, common uh, opcodes uh, like uh, the, what was the name, uh, the blue pill. No, the red pill trick, yeah, just uh, SLDT uh, execution, and you get the value and you compare, but it's the blue pill or whatever. Uh, so, and also some OS bugs, because sometimes uh, uh, Windows XP was doing wrong job trying to tell you which was the, ex uh, the exception that just happened. And it would be a way to make the difference between the actual OS and the emulator that would, be try that would try to be logic. Uh, export uh, cost is written in assembly, so uh, there's no extra, there's no, it's not compiled and it's not generated. But uh, to make it uh, self-documented, I, I created internal export so that uh, each section of the file is easy to browse so that you will know um, what, if you would quickly want to jump to the 64 bytes part and everything, then yeah, it's easier via the export. And also I wanted it to print a message uh, in the most convenient way. So, uh, but if you print, if you keep printing a message, then it will make the assembly wider, I mean, uh, longer to scroll. So I use a vector exception handling so and a fake uh, opcode so that you have the comments of what's going to happen appearing directly in the code. So it's a kind of self-documented without debug symbol uh, file. And uh, as you saw, it doesn't have much of output, but as actually it has a lot of debug outputs like 100, uh, I forgot, uh, message. And it's even saying, trick, I'm going to do this, and then uh, I'm going to do that. So trying to make it helpful, yet a bit, uh, a bit uh, hard to, to disassemble. Um, can anyone understand what this code is doing? This is one of my favorite. Yeah, there's no trick this time. This is not a... <laughs> Yeah, 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 sir. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So basically, you push some arguments on the stack and you jump to here. So basically, uh, with the return file, you will jump. So you, I push the EIP uh, on the stack with a 33 uh, word. So basically, I will be returning far to this. So basically, I will return back to this EIP in the uh, selector 33. Uh, if this is in a 64-bit OS and this is a 32-bit process, you will return back to execution here in 64-bit mode because uh, uh, selector 33 is the selector for 64-bit mode, which you can access from a 32-bit process. So basically, this code will be executed first in the current selector with, uh, so as you would see, and then it's executed back in on selector 33, which means in 64-bit mode. So you have the same EIP, you, you have, the, have the same opcodes, but the disassembly will be different, and I chose some opcodes that would make uh, opco uh, mnemonics specific to each size, 32 bits or 64-bit size. So it's, a b it's already quite a mm, wait, bitch to disassemble, because same EIP, so unless you're careful about the, the, op the um, the selector, well, it's a problem. And I think the APIs, debu Windows uh, debugging APIs are just unable to, 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 to make you step through that. It's a problem of the API, not a problem of IDA or WinDBG itself. So basically, you can't debug that code in 64-bit mode. And you could do that uh, if you just, and but if you s uh, run over it after you return to the original selector, which is why there is the push CS here, and you go back to end with this, the original selector, execution will go through quickly, but you cannot step through that code. So killing the disassemblers and debuggers, but and yet simple. So here is the result that you get when you run cost with the latest, well, the latest public version of Hue. I think it's been, it's well, it's going to be fixed. So this is a hint knob that's not documented by uh, Intel, and it's a bit uh, forgotten by most, most disassemblers. So WinDBG and uh, Hue are giving you uh, undocumented uh, well, question marks or the Hue style of question marks. Um, then, since I this was originally what I planned to present uh, hash days, but then I decided to bring a few tricks in the cost itself on the PE side of things. So this is the header. So it has MZ and then it's some text. So you can type cost and it has some text. I made it typable. And the P head, the NT headers, 
the P headers, the one starting with P, is actually at the bottom of the file. The bottom of the file is here, so it's a footer. And uh, I made it so that the values are quite critical. I mean, so they are not the one you would expect. So this is the result that you would get when you were loading a cost under IDA 6.1. So, uh, yeah, some values were random and everything. But if you just have, if y with cost, you can test, so you can set the values of a register and then compare it, but you cannot test all the possibilities of PE files with a single file because you have to choose. So, for example, cost has no section, it has wrong, weird alignments and everything, but you cannot make all the possible case. So I, go I went on and I created another page on Korkami with, as usual, uh, the um, proof of concept, some graphs about P files and everything. So it's, I don't consider it finished, but I consider good enough to break a bit everything. And are, I already created more than 100 proof of concept, which try zero section, big alignments, huge alignments, and I have some funny results. So here is the virtual section table versus hue. So um, when you're on low alignments, you can have no sections, or, you, or the section table can be empty. So basically, I made the size of optional header point in virtual uh, memory space, which means the section table is out of the PE file. And Hugh doesn't like this. And the consequence of that is that he doesn't even think it's a PE file while well, it's fully working. But this trick only works under XP because uh, Windows 7 is a bit more tricky, picky on the, on the unused section table values. Uh, so when you got some ASCII art in the in the data directories, then you probably think you can probably guess that there's something going on. If you have better ASCII art suggestion or ears, so basically this is the dual PE header that was presented by Reversing Labs in uh, Black Hat. So uh, I, I you are familiar with that? No. Yes. No. So basically, you extend the size of headers so that the um, the headers will the P the NT headers will be actually mapped at the bottom of the file so th that when it's uh, so that it's far enough to reach section alignment and when you load that in memory the first section will actually be mapped over it on f uh, the top the, the the first part of the optional header is the one used on disk so this is what is used to check if the file will load but the data directories are, are read from the values in memory so first the optional header is passed is mapped in memory, then the section is folding itself over the bottom part of the header, and then the true data directories that were originally at the start of the section will be taken in account. So all this is garbage and is visible on disk. It follows the size of optional header, but actually in memory, this is not what is, what is used to be parsed. Um, another th weird thing is that the export names can just be absolutely anything until a null character, which means non-ASCII, whatever. And the problem, another funny thing is that a hue displays them in line. So you can just put ads your own ads because those are just export names. And one of those export is actually uh, more than 60K so that it's good enough to create a buffer overflow if your tool is not careful about that. And it's also possible to have a null export like just a character null and you can import a null API with no problem. Uh, I also ju just trying to see the different possibilities. I created a few uh, files that had the maximum number of sections. The limit is 96 under XP, but it's 64K under uh, Vista and 7, which means, uh, well, I know only debug 2. The latest only debug gives you a funny message, but it still loads the file. Only debug 1 crashes directly on this file. Um, still some time. Um, and the one last, not very visual, but I found I noticed that the address of index of the TLS is, is overwritten on loading, and imports the terminator of imports uh, is n doesn't need to be five uh, null D word, but only if the name is zero, then the des the descriptor, the import descriptor, is considered the terminator. And so basically, if you make address of index point to the name of an import descriptor, you could get that overwritten. And then the imports will be truncated, will be considered truncated. And actually, the behavior is different under XP or Windows 7. So on under XP, it's overwritten before, uh, after imports loading. So the whole import table is not truncated. While on Windows 7, it's happening at the before the imports are loaded, which means you have the same P, but different loading behavior under different version of Windows. And the file works on both, uh, on both version of Windows. Oh, yeah, sorry, before that, maybe I still have some time. How long do I have? 
So, 15 minutes late? Okay, so, sorry, I'll, st I'll just I'll do the demo. I'll go through the... Okay, so this is just to prove... Sorry? Sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I understood. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, I um, just to show you how the, f the kind of... Oh, uh, resizing. So this is the, the kind of PE files that I typically create. So I only define the elements that, you, that I that just need to work. And this is actually a driver. So I, even though I created, I used some undocumented opcodes, I use some undocumented of codes. It's a working driver, and it doesn't have the usual uh, uh, stuff you have in the driver. So you can uh, is this this just to say that this is a kind of uh, proof of concept, uh, clear to see. You don't have external stuff that bo that bugs your view or your your debugging. So this is um, this one is just to see the the the, the possible values of CR zeros via the SMSW, which is theoretically undefined on higher words, but it actually gives you the same value with as the standard move EAXCR0. And here is move EAXCR0 with the, with, the, uh, with the wrong mode RM, which in the latest hue is actually uh, wrongly, uh, incorrectly, well, not disassembled at all. And it so if you just, uh, sorry, whoops. Let's hope it doesn't crash. Oops. So as you can see, you get exactly the same value whether you're using the normal CR0, the invalid one, and the undefined. Uh, so the upper part is supposed to be undefined. Usually when it's undefined, it's zeros in Intel language. But here it just works fine. And my machine didn't even crash, which means the driver is fine. <laughs> so you can study small drivers. Um, the first proof of concept that I, crea that I presented here was the one with the old disassembly. So anyone still knows the what the value is? So basically, the, some opcodes are here for garbage, just to, pro the, to prove that they are actually uh, they, they are just used as junk. But still, the registers are actually modified, and uh, the, these uh, uh, opcodes from the 70s or something or the just the, the, the early 80s, are still perfectly working on a modern CPU or even on i7. Uh, to one of the proof of concept I created is the one that actually tests the values, the initial values, so that you can see uh, what the would be the possible values, whether it's on XP or Windows 7. Uh, so each time I just, uh, save all the, I just save all the values of the registers, and then I compare them to possible values, so I test them one after each other. Uh, actually, on TLS, you have much more uh, control of the values because the values you will get in the TLS, um, on, lo on loading in the TLS are the TLS RVA, the callbacks, the size of the TLS. You get that in EB. Uh, well, I forgot exactly, but it's in the source. So you, you can get running this into will help you to actually uh, mimic an emulator better if you, uh, an OS better in your emulator, if that's what you're interested. So SMSW is actually the one comparing, uh, so the one using SMSW, then comparing the value, and then checking wh when the register, whether the register changed, and then when it reverts normally. A funny fact that I would like an explanation, if you know it, is that actually this behavior, the behavior of this uh, file is different if you run the file normally, or if you run it with a redirection. So if you pipe, the, co the output, you get a, a fail result, and if you run the file normally, it just works. So I would like, so here, I will just run it, and then I will run into a file, and then just type the result. And, oops. Normal execution, okay. Redirection, fail. If you guys have any explanation for that, I'm all ears. Oh, I didn't try that. I didn't try that. <laughs> Just <laughs> so you would, would pipe to another device and yeah, but then how you get back to printer or uh, yeah. yeah, I don't so have a com device or. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but I it was a big surprise because I was I had a test uh, bench, uh, and then fail, mm -hmm. and then I run. Okay, uh, so okay, I, I have no idea why. Um, the GS trick, quite uh, simple, and I also have some uh, some uh, out some output. So I modified GS, then I reset and wait it for reset, and then I'm doing two reset and checking the time between so that uh, it shouldn't happen too quickly. Nops. So, do I, yeah. Um, so I'm testing the undocumented knobs. I'm testing the knobs that are on invalid page. And I'm testing the, sorry, I will actually debug it. So standard knobs. Thirty two bit mob, then the knob on t oh yeah, sorry. Now I can't do it because I don't have sixty four bit mode. Yeah, that's why. So all my all, all my sixty four bit tests are still done in thirty two bit process so that you can run them on a normal OS and it then it detects by GS if there is sixty four bit available and in this case you will get a different result. So if you run it on sixty four bit, which I don't have here, you will actually get the actual test on sixty four bit and uh, pri the result printed out. But still, it's not possible to actually uh, debug that easily. But it's at least there is no trick over there, so it's 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 easy to bring back to a 64-bit uh, process. Um, push red. So here you print the output, and then Oli nicely tells you that you will jump to 408, but actually. Here, the, the display actually is correct here. It will actually return here. And the TLS already created the null page, which prints fail. So it's as expected. But th there is no standard way to disassemble that correctly. Uh, I can't execute the 50, the, 60 f the working 64K section. And actually, I'm executing all the code. So I'm just starting at the beginning. The, the sections are quite big. And I'm, I'm modifying EAX so that all the zeros are executed. And just to do a printf in the end, it actually takes a few seconds to execute on the, 60 on the i7. So it's quite funny to see uh, you launch it. Even when the cache is loaded and the, f the OS is ready to, to be fast, you launch it. And printf comes a few seconds later. So <laughs> virtual section is the one that Hugh doesn't think it's a P, uh, P at all. So this is the latest Hue. Well, it's been patched anyway, but uh, be just because, yeah, well, I can't browse P <laughs> on you now that I can't, that it doesn't think it's a P file, but basically it thinks that the optional header points to the end of the file, beyond the end of the file. The folded header, oh yeah, a few error messages because of the wrong data directories and the actual data directories at, at the start. Um, at the start of the section. So these are, this will be the imports and uh, the, f the actual real, uh, uh, the actual real uh, data directories. And last, the one with the, uh, the TLS address of index that is pointing, oops. That is pointing inside the imports at the address of name. So it will override the loading. And when you just load it, um, it just says, oh, it's XP because my imports were loaded this way and not the other. And if you run that file, it will give you another reason. And then the exports, where some exp some of the exports are actually very long, and you, well, you have kind of you 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 can see that actually here I'm even taking over the disassembly, so I'm just repeating the same fake uh, opcodes and address, so you could actually uh, fool the disassembler that way. Mm, I think it's just a visual effect. There are no b big problems, but it's a problem. It's a known problem that was fixed recently in IDA that if you put an export in the middle of the instruction, then the the fake export would actually take over the disassembly, and then it that would ruin the disassembly. 
there, there's actually a proof of concept uh, for that in the in Corcomy, as of course. So that's for that's all for the demos. Oops. So I I wanted to know more about x86 and p, which are far from f uh, perfectly documented and are still not perfectly documented. But at least I've been covering uh, some parts of it. Uh, there are still some uh, gray areas, but at least every day I'm just learning a, a bit more and publishing my results and sharing them openly. Uh, like WinDBG, if you will actually follow the official, only the official documentations, uh, you will only g get bad results with malwares and packers out there. So if you yourself are interested or you develop a tool, an emulator, an engine or whatever, well, you know, you can just uh, fix, uh, visit Corkami, read the page and download the, all the the proof of concept which are available and if you find uh, any bugs which might happen then uh, send me a postcard or send me a red cross t-shirt <laughs> so thanks to peter ferry and all my reviewers and people who contributed you have any questions no 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 Yeah, but I'm not. Then I wouldn't be good to actually uh, turn them into exploitation or anything. So I don't know. Yeah, but uh, already breaking uh, uh, all the disassemblers and stuff uh, was good enough. I uh, I found a crash in uh, Intel Z, which was uh, yeah, good enough. <laughs> Any other question? Everybody survived the presentation. Hmm. Thank you. So thank you.